myself out. I am afraid of this. I'm terrified and paralyzed by. I am deathly afraid of. Welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast with your host, me, Ryan Perio. Hello, and welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Perio. This week, my guest is Max DeBrito. Max is a car buying concierge out of Arizona. He has worked in the automotive industry since 2015. He is legally blind, but he has been charged with selling and and photographing cars Everywhere he's gone, he's become one of the best pioneers in automotive sales, starting his own business, the Car Buyer's Concierge, which you can check out. In this episode, we talk about his story of being legally blind and how his love of cars has led him to owning his own business and just the fears that come along with being having a physical challenge such as an or an impairment and basically inspiring others to with similar impairments or disabilities to to reach out and still follow their dreams and that they can still achieve what they want out of life. Don't let those limitations stop you. So let's get into this interview right now with Max DeBrito. All right, my guest this week is Max DeBrito, who is launching his own training basically, for helping people in the auto purchasing realm basically have a great understanding kind of of how the auto purchase should work. Now, Max, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yourself? I am doing well. It's it's actually been a nice weather day here this weekend. I Usually Easter weekend turns to be, in, in our area, to be like a super stormy, rainy kind of weekend, and that's been 65 and sunny and like a nice little breeze. Well, enjoy uh, enjoy that weather while you can. It's definitely definitely not common out there. Yeah, short lived. Uh, you're from Ari- you're in Arizona, correct? Yep, here it's pretty nice. Well, so yeah, you get that. So you get the same thing. Correct. It's- yeah, it's about eighty five today. It's a little on the warmer side, but it's still a beautiful. Day. Yeah, for for what it normally is, it's it's nice. So, how did you how did you land? Are you from Arizona originally? Is that your home base all the time, or did you move from somewhere else? I am originally from here. I've moved all over the place. My dad's in corporate America. So, you know, moved all over and I moved back here because I wanted to spend more time with my grandparents um, while I had the opportunity and also grow my career in the automotive industry. So how did you get into the automotive industry? How did that come about? It's funny. Um, It's actually a funny story. So I've always been into cars, um, very much so into cars. And I really enjoyed going to dealerships as a kid, you know, and was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this one day. And it's been a crazy, crazy road because it is a really insane career. You know, the interesting thing about it is the car business is the wild west, but um, the funny kicker about it is I am, uh, I'm legally blind, so I don't even drive. And so you know, basically it started with me trying to be in sales and every dealership I was going to in Nashville, where I lived at the time, basically said, well, you need a license to, to sell. Um, some stores you do, some you don't, um, because coincidentally enough, a lot of car salespeople have some pretty bad alcoholic problems. And so they do have stores with no drive lists, um, interestingly enough, but none of the ones I encountered did. And the funny thing is, I ended up walking into a dealership, locally owned, you know, nothing really happened. Like two weeks later, I was working at Sam's Club at the time, uh, crushing it in cell phone sales. And two weeks later, I get a call. Hey, you know, I'm I'm the sales manager here. I saw you have your resume on our debt on my desk. It came across my desk and wanted to talk to you because I noticed that in college you did some social media stuff. So ended up interviewing and started in the industry. I had no idea it would launch into a successful career. Um, I started in the industry at $10 an hour for three hours a day 
doing social media work, not even like marketing per se, but just content for this small Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram dealership. And, you know, I had a kind of a grasp of what to do and understood it, but there was a lot of fears and apprehension going into it. Like, oh, oh my goodness, you know, going into this brand new industry, that's pretty insane. And, uh, you know, so really worked hard and pursued, pursued, you know, getting to know more about the industry itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in my office one day, it's funny, $10 an hour and three hours a day, you, I ended up getting my own office. (laughs) I ended up getting approached by the owner and she was like, Hey, you take really good pictures on our social media sites. And it was like, okay, I'm legally blind and I'm taking pictures for this dealership. Uh, Pretty funny, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. So get this, she walks into my office and keep in mind, this is 2015 and they have not had a social media department before. They barely have pictures on their website, you know, kind of behind the times a little bit. And she walks into my office and says, Hey, can you go take some pictures of some of the cars in the showroom? I want to see how you do and put them on our website as like, you know, the inventory photos. And I did, and, you know, had this really kind of old DSLR camera they had in the dealership sitting around and did, and they loved the pictures. So the legally blind guy who can't drive is now taking pictures at the dealership. Yeah, you're like the Peter Parker of the dealership. Exactly. I'm sorry, you were saying? I was saying you're Peter Parker. You just basically come in and, but I mean, I get that too. I -hmm. wonder if you're a great photographer because of your blindness and just, just the fact that you had, that you take so much time and effort to see that you, it just, it even comes out even clearer because you have to be able to see it versus somebody that maybe has 2010 Eagle vision, just kind of glances, gets it. You take the time and detail to use your, I guess, weakness to be your biggest advantage in that situation. Exactly. And I was pretty freaked out. I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work. I left my job at Sam's club to do this full time and was kind of like freaking out. And it ended up working well for that reason, because for, somebody with vision issues, it's more of a mathematical equation than Mm -hmm. anything. You know, if I can do this, this, and this, in theory, it has to be good. Yeah. And so that's what ended up happening. And, you know, a lot of dealerships, the way they operate is they have somebody come in and take their pictures, or they have a team of two or three people. I was one guy. So I had to get a vehicle detailed because, you know, we had power lines everywhere and bird crap on everything. Had to get them, had to get them washed had to get pictures taken, edit the pictures and upload the pictures from start to finish. I think I was averaging between 50 minutes and 60 minutes a car, which is crazy because like there are vendors out there who will bring five people to your dealership for an hour and do a hundred cars, you know, cause they've got this like assembly line, but you know, I got to be careful what I say here, but what I will say, this will really sh- shock the listeners is the, the fear part of it that came up was, and the problem that came up was, well, we have volume. We have 500 cars we got to take pictures of. You know, Chrysler wants, you know, a certain percentage of new car pictures on the website. So, you know, they want it all uniformed and everything and want the same backdrop. So the cars have to move. Mm-hmm. I'm legally blind. I can't move the cars. I mean, I've been trained to drive just in case of like an emergency situation, but like insurance wise, I can't move the cars and I'm kind of freaking out. I'm like, well, I guess they don't need me anymore. I'm probably going to end up somewhere else. That was to me, that was my, the end of my career in the car business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had this like Porter kid that would help me move cars every like two or three hours a day, but it ended up getting to the point you know, and, and this is a very locally owned dealership to the point where I was offered for Christmas a a mason jar of moonshine as a Christmas bonus. Um, but basically stupid, stupid me at like 19, 20 years old, I think it was 20, it was like right out of college, 
went into the dealership or went into the owner's office and said, Hey, can I drive around the lot? Obviously not on the street. That would be illegal. But since this is technically private property, can I drive on the lot to get my job done? And if I wreck anything, I pay for the damages. Now, older me would never, ever, ever do that again for the safety risks and also the pure cost. Yeah. I was just stupid and naive in my career. I would never do that again. In fact, every other dealership I've worked at since I signed contracts stating that I will not drive a vehicle, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so now you have this legally blind guy and I can see like 20, 30 feet clearly, you know, it's not like I'm totally blind. It's just, I don't have depth perception. Yeah. Is now the dealership photographer. I'm handling social media. I'm covering events, going to car shows. And I'm driving around their cars at five miles an hour on the lot. Mm -hmm. And again, there was that deal. If you wreck something, yeah, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> but there was a lot of fear in that of like, oh, my gosh, if I so much as scratch something, mm -hmm. it's going to go very sour. And ended up basically back to the thinking of things mathematically thing. I parked hundreds if not a thousand plus vehicles and never hit anything because I would literally get out of the car and walk around it and do the math to put it back in the spot. I'm glad the story ended with you not hitting anything. Cause I was like, young, yeah. cause you prefaced it by young. If I had, if I had done it over again, it sounded like, Oh, we probably, it sounds like we, we, we hit something and yeah. <laughs> we learned our lesson, but still, that's yeah. got to be, you know, it's, you know, it's still amazing control because your adrenaline had to be pumping to, with the keys in your hand, knowing that, okay, this could go very badly. I'd, I have to have all my focus mm -hmm. and all my attention on this because I look down one time and look up and my job and everything could be over and I could be paying for it. You're like, mm -hmm. it's almost like you're in the mayhem, those all state mayhem commercials where you got the guy, you'd be paying for this yourself. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, there was a lot of like crippling fear of like, okay, if I don't do this, I don't have a career in this industry and I just love cars. And if I do do this, I have a career, but it's super sketchy. It's not technically illegal. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. fine because they own the dealership and it's public pro or private property, but it's, really dumb and again i would never ever 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 do this again yeah. but you know it makes for an interesting story you know i mean there were days when i was literally like sweating like oh my goodness just freaking out i mean they they gave me hellcats and you know creeping a hellcat with 700 horsepower along at two or three miles an hour you know being safe is quite interesting you know just because they don't they they aren't built for that um, but, uh, but no, I mean, so overcoming that fear was basically like, okay, well, I have two options at this point. I can, I can figure out what to do and do something else, or I can keep doing this. And the door ended up opening and, um, I ended up getting into internet sales. Uh, or BDC, what it's called, which is basically where you would bring someone in and hand them to a salesperson, mm -hmm. was given maybe 30 minutes of training. And the internet manager said, hey, next week, I'll be out for a few days and you need to handle this. Yeah. And it's just crippling, like, oh my God, like, what do I do? And it started going well. But the, I guess the long story of working at that store was the the way I overcame that fear really was the same thing I've been dealing with lifelong as a disabled person is yes, everything is very crippling. Even now in a successful career living on my own, there are some very, very intimidating things um, for a disabled person to do. And you just kind of got to do, them, yeah. you know, so it, it sucks, but you got to kind of surround yourself with the right people that'll encourage you and just go. But I went, I went to a Toyota, Toyota dealership after that and was in internet sales, basically became the internet sales manager's right-hand guy. 
left that position, went to uh, moved out to Phoenix, started working for a Land Rover store. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really learned the industry. Um, and that that's where the fear kind of crept back up again of like, oh, my gosh, am I in the right thing? Lots of anxiety because in Nashville, it was a really small market and it, dealerships weren't that well oiled. They are now. But, mm -hmm. you know, back then it was still a smaller town. So most dealerships out here in Phoenix do not have inventory over 400 or over 45 days, 60 days old if they absolutely have to. In Nashville, the norm was 200 days. And at the Chrysler dealership, because I don't think they were really up to how modern business was run, there were cars that were over a year in inventory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so going from seeing cars normally 200 days to, oh, at 60 days, we get out of them, even if it's a loss, like that change in pace, if you will, and professionalism was insane. Mm -hmm. So I started as an internet manager at the Land Rover store and was basically like, I, you know, what I did as an internet manager in Nashville was totally different to being an internet manager in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And so they were expecting more of a sales manager type role. And I was expecting more of a like, not necessarily BDC, but selling out of state, handling the internet internet leads type role. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, a total rude awakening of like, holy crap, what did I just get myself into? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And obviously they they had believed in me and to, to hire me. But um, but you know, it it ended up working out and there was a lot of anxiety at that store just because going from Toyota to Land Rover for the first six months was just so different, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with clients who care about a $20,000 car and clients that have nine $200,000 cars and they want their wife's daily driver, totally different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, that kind of anxiety of like, oh my gosh, what am I doing mm -hmm. crept in. But again, you got to have that support group and you just got to got to put your head down and go right yeah so who is your support group like and when you say your support group so who is who would you call it consider your support group so i have i have a, a variety of mentors both both on the you know vocational side the like character side and the like religious side mm -hmm. um and so i you know talk to these older gentlemen on a very regular basis um, I also have a group of other individuals who have disabilities who go for it and work hard. And we all kind of encourage each other like, hey, man, I know this is a challenge, but like, let's go. Because, okay. you know, you can sit with a disability on the couch and not do anything about it, or you can try and figure out what sticks. And, you know, overcoming that is a challenge because it is a, a fear of the unknown. You're like, holy crap, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, but you just got to push through and, you know, once you do, you basically, you know, realize that, OK, you know, I'm much more capable than what society says my disabled disability limit limits me to. OK, now, have you now you, we talk about it, your dis, your uh, vision and stuff, and that's kind of your mm -hmm. fear is that. Be the the life of it, it, with a disability is sometimes that people can either one take advantage of you or two, maybe you're missing something because it's not something that your eyes are picking up. Has that mm -hmm. ever happened to you? Like, has someone seen your vision disability and taken advantage of that? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a normal psychological thing that wherever you go, you're always kind of viewed as like the kid in the room mm -hmm. you know um just because it's like oh this guy's got a disability and like you you're kind of thought of differently um so I, I think that that naturally happens in a lot of cases i haven't seen a lot of it maliciously yeah um more of it's just been kind of by accident oddly enough mm -hmm. um in the Nashville airport, I got kicked out of a bar because they thought I was drunk because of my nystagmus. <laughs> and like, it's more of that side. I don't really see a lot of 
crazy issues. Yeah. Um, it's just more of that kind of like you're kind of the underdog in the room. Yeah. Well, good on you. You've you've uh, you've obviously you know learned your craft and gotten to the point. A lot of the stuff that you that not only can you survive, you can flourish. And mm-hmm. it's it's awesome that it's something you love to do, even though you can't take full advantage of it with the impairment that you can't take advantage fully. You're lo- you can sit on them, you can ride in the passenger seat, but sadly, mm-hmm. it, you're unable to drive. Does that is that kind of bittersweet, or is it just or just something about the car that you, even without driving it that you just enjoy? It is bittersweet, but at the same time, I do just enjoy the art of it. The way dealerships kind of look at you as a disabled person is like, yeah, you can't drive. But at the same time, at the Land Rover store, when we get a used R8 or something in on trade, everybody wants to go drive it, but I'm not grabbing the keys to it. Yeah. You know, so you're kind of viewed as this like this guy who you don't care to joyride stuff. So you just care about business. And that's kind of the beauty of it is it's something, you know, I work with vehicles. I, I love the art and the design, but I'm I have have the opportunity to care more about the business and not let the emotion get in the way. Um, funnily enough, I have owned a, a slew of vehicles. Um <laughs> You can technically do that. Yeah. Uh, you just can't finance them. And basically my deal with my parents, my friends, whoever is, I will buy this cool car if you guys drive me around in it. And they've all been investments, a lot of like older Porsches and some Audis here and there and stuff. But you just kind of, for me, owning the car, mm-hmm. when I bought my first Porsche, it, it was an achievement of I'm not technically like, I'm not like most people are like, why would you do that? Cause you can't drive it. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was an accomplishment. I've worked very hard. I've got this challenge and now I'm the legally blind guy with the Porsche at cars and coffee, you know? Yeah. Um, so what, what is that? What, what is that? It, there's something too, when you buy a car that you just, you sit in it. You, exactly. You stare at it. You go check on it. It like, like a baby, like mm-hmm. you're, like some like sometimes I found myself going back out to my car just to look at it. Like I would like, oh, I think I forgot something just to go get another glimpse of my car parked. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you're right. It is an accomplishment. It is a it's it's a symbol of it's a it's a rolling symbol of your status. It is it mm-hmm. is your status when you can't when they can't see your house or your clothes. Well, for me, it's not really a status thing. It's just I'm a big car guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, just sitting in a sitting in an old Porsche, the smell of the German leather, the sound the engine makes, mm-hmm. you know, like the beauty of how it was built. Um, yeah. Not much beauty in the repair cost, but you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> that is uh, the ugly. That is the ugly truth of any German car is the is the is the maintenance mm-hmm. and repairs once the warranty goes out. Yeah. But I'd literally just go sit in the driver's seat and, you know, like read a book or something. But it was just kind of a cool, interesting thing. And it's funny on Instagram, my my personal account is actually the legally blind photographer. And you'll see some of those old cars on there. But, um, you know, it's it's just interesting. And so my, you know, my career has been around and my goal in, in life is to use my career mm-hmm. And love for cars to basically tell people, hey, this guy who's not supposed to really be in the car business is in the car business, you know, so what can you, what's stopping you from doing what you want to do? But not even just in the car business, he's flourishing in the car business. Like you are, you're, you're making, you're, you're trying to take the next step because maybe, because I, I know there are people that like there's reasons that those Carvana and places that no haggle thing exist. Mm-hmm. And it's because that people either are afraid of, or just leery of the whole car buying experience. Exactly. And what, what my business does, the car buyers concierge, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, feel free to go to the website or also my, my Facebook or Instagram, but what, what, what I do. And the reason I started this is, you know, working with customers for so long um, and being in that space, both in the high end and even in first cars, people walk into the dealership 
very nervous, very apprehensive, kind of afraid of stuff. And that, that, that overcomes their ability to make certain decisions. Yeah. And, you know, obviously in sales, you want to put emphasis on something you want to, you know, sell someone something, but the successful people in the industry, you know, they aren't just trying to get you to buy a car. Now they're, they're trying to educate you and help you make a quality decision. So that way you come next time, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a relationship that they built. And that is the goal of my services is to tell people, Hey, I'm not a sales guy. Well, let's explain all of the options out there, you know, mm -hmm. things that may or may not make sense for you. So you can make a rational educated decision and not have that kind of apprehension that they're trying to sell you something. So that way you can walk into the dealership educated and empowered to make the quality decision that you want to make. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's all about educating the customer and really taking the stress out of the process. So I do hourly consultations, which are about that really explaining how things work, you know, different products like, you know, gap insurance and warranties and whatnot that are available. So many people freak out about them. Mm -hmm. But if you sit down and do the numbers, some of them can make sense. And, you know, if you say no, you, yeah, you might save some money, but you might be kind of shooting yourself in the foot. And a lot of people will say no to that simply because a salesperson is presenting it. And for me, it's like, okay, well, let's make, let's see if this makes sense for you, you know, yeah. and, and really giving the power, you know, and the education to the consumer. And then I also do um, I also work deals for customers. Like I'm, I'm working a deal right now in, in uh, California for a customer where, you know, they're basically paying me to vet all of the, you know, vehicles we're looking at and to basically work the deal from start to finish. So all they do is either electronically sign for a car or they walk into the dealership and sign. They're not there for six hours. They're not freaking out that that the store's trying to do something and pull them over something they're you know they can walk in confidently that i've handled this for them and i'm still walking them through step by step the entire process so they can make a comfortable and educated decision that's awesome and mm -hmm. good on you for like doing the the legwork because i feel like a lot of that is not just them saying no because it's the dealer but it's because there's no, they're not giving any information on their side. They're just asking if you want this and yep. it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like, exactly. it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a good idea because they just, they just add, throw it in. It's almost like, Hey, do you want a free car wash or something like that? Or, you know, Hey, do you want to pay mm -hmm. for, do you want to pay for, for us to come out and, and polish your car? Yeah. Absolutely. And and the big thing about this service as well that I started never worked for a store that had these issues, mm -hmm. but there are dealerships out there that, you know, and I, I'm obviously not going to name names, but there are dealerships out there that will secure a zero down loan mm -hmm. and, you know, tell you, you need 4,500 bucks down and you don't, and you're financing the full amount and giving them your money, mm -hmm. you know, and like a lot of people, are also very afraid of that happening. Yeah. And so having an expert kind of look it over for you gives you a little bit of that peace of mind and helps you conquer that, you know, and kind of educate you on the process, you know, moving forward. You know, I mean, I, you know, back when I used to, you know, work in the dealership world, I mean, obviously I still, still am, I'm just not employed by a dealership um, per se, a new car dealership, just because, uh, you know, just like I, I would get trades every once in a while. It didn't happen often where somebody thought they signed up for a 48 month loan and they ended up signing up for like a 60 month lease and they owed 90 grand on a $35,000 asset. The store just worked them. And obviously that's fraudulent and that's very unethical. And it's not a super common scenario, but people are afraid of those scenarios because they read about it on the internet, you yeah. know? So the one time it does happen, it gets publicized. It does. Yeah. So, you know, I, I eliminate those issues, but it, it's a fun, it's a fun world. I love to make people happy and to take the stress out of it. It's also good on the side of the sales guys. Cause the sales guys are kind of freaking out. 
Yeah. The veterans know what they're doing, but some dealerships have so much turnover that you're pretty much always working with a green pea. Yeah. And the green peas aren't really properly trained. They kind of know what they're doing, but not fully. And so they're stressed out that their manager's on their back and they don't know why. And then the customer comes in automatically disliking the salesperson because they've heard stories and the customer is afraid of getting taken for the salesperson's, you know, afraid of losing a sale and being, you know, chewed out by a manager. So it's just a, not a pleasant experience for, for people in a lot of cases. I'm not saying that's every store. Most stores are pretty straightforward, but like, why not make it a good transaction for both parties? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I just, I always tell people when they when they feel like they if they they don't know if they got taken. I was like, well, did you? Would I just tell people when I walk in is like I have a set price. This is this is where I'm how far I'm willing to go. If mm-hmm. as long as I'm in those parameters, I'm okay. Like maybe yep. maybe they did take you. Maybe they did you know squelch the numbers and make a profit, but they didn't violate my first rule, which was try to get me to go over my my limit. Hmm. Well, there you go. Walking in with a budget. Yeah. So that's yep. that's my that's my idea. I don't know if it's the best idea because people are like, yeah, but you still. I was like, but I if you if you sit there and do that, you'll all you can always find fault in anything. You're mm-hmm. you're how much time are you spending? You know, finding out if you got if you didn't get a good deal versus if you would have done that beforehand. Exactly, and. You know, once you're in the industry long enough, you kind of know what stores are willing to do off the bat. So it's a pretty straightforward process where I've got the customer's best interest in mind to to mitigate that process. But the way that the dealership looks at it, consumer versus consultant um, or even broker, is, you know, you walk in as a consumer and they're like, okay, well, I can have this guy sit at my desk for four hours and potentially sell another product or two. Mm -hmm. Like to them, it's worth you sitting there for two hours to make another thousand bucks or two thousand bucks. But in most cases, with what I'm doing and what I've been finding is stores are like, okay, this person obviously knows how this is structured. So we're just going to make an easy transaction. And if if the broker has a good experience, then they'll probably bring us somebody else. So it's really a straightforward transaction. Yeah, that's awesome. It's just viewed differently. Yep. So... I have, I'm always curious, like, what is buying a new car a better deal or is a used car a better deal? Because that seems to be a endless debate between my friends. Some people are a pro used car, saying that you know you're you're getting the depreciated value, which is nice, but with a new car, mm-hmm. you're also getting you know bigger bigger deals and things of initial discounts that like zero percent finance and cash back that mm-hmm. that could basically supplement what a used car is which is a used car is pretty much as is you're just getting the depreciated value and maybe a low interest rate if you got killer credit yep it all just depends on what you want to do basically because every vin number is different mm-hmm. and the bank looks at every vin number differently so you know it's not necessarily on new or used it's on you know, if the asset itself makes sense for the bank, some vehicles depreciate faster than others. Some, you know, depreciate like barely anything at all, like a Tundra or Forerunner at the time of this recording. But I think it's, it's all down to education too, because, you know, if you go in and you buy a 15 year old or even a 12 year old car with 140,000 miles on it, that's 15 grand and you buy a 2017 Corolla that's five years old with 60,000 miles on it for the same money, your APR is going to be 24% on the first one, and it's going to be 4%, 5% on the second one. So in theory, if you're willing to pay the 24% on the $15,000 asset, just go buy a nicer car with lower miles. And Mm -hmm. since the APR will be lower, it'll supplement. So 15 grand, and I don't have a calculator in front of me, but 15 grand with high APR is really like spending 21 grand with low APR. So basically, it's all about that VIN number in that car. Like, do you want more of your money going towards the actual asset itself, or do you want more of your money actually going towards interest? You know? Yeah. Um, And a lot of people don't 
don't think about those things. So it's not a new versus used. It's really just loan eligibility, eligibility, debt to income, the vehicle itself. Yeah. There's, there's so many factors. It's like a pot. You're making a pot of stew and you've got to, you know, stir it and make that recipe make sense, you know, and that's something that gives a lot of people anxiety, but again, that's what I seek to educate. That's have some fun. Mm -hmm. And so how many, how many people have you like, I guess, how, how long have you been doing the concierge? Uh, so I started in 2000 or I'm sorry, I started in uh, October, but I, I've been in the industry since 15 Mm -hmm. and every good salesperson does 10 or 12 deals a year, if not more for like friends and family. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'm at the point where I have friends who are on their third or fourth car with me. So I'm just going to start this business and grow it, you know, monetize it. And, you know, like I said before, make it, I want to make a more pleasant transaction for people and and educate people. That's, that's super awesome. I I mean, I don't know how else to describe it because there is, there's so much to that. I mean, that's such a, it's such a great niche. And I was like, you could even, I was even talking about maybe, you know, doing a podcast where you could either, you know, have a segment about like funny, funny dealership stories and, you mm-hmm. know, and maybe just tackle a certain topic about the car buying experience that day, you know, and just, you could run through and just have a little series that kind of lightly yep. educate consumers and then just basically, you know, link it to your business to say, Hey, if you still have questions, Mm-hmm. You know, and just make it almost like a lead generator where they just they start with questions, but if they feel out of their depths, like, hey, let's go ahead and talk about maybe setting something up to to assist you. Exactly. My goal is to do that. I'm working on setting that up right now, setting up some interviews, you know, because there are stories on YouTube and whatnot, yeah. but it's all like, you know, something about a Ferrari or whatever clickbait. Like people yeah. don't realize how wild west like a, a normal Chevy dealership is. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen salespeople like fight each other. I've seen salespeople fight customers, found countless odd things and trade-ins. And so just interviewing people, but I want to use it not only for, for the business, obviously, but I want to use it as a platform to inspire salespeople to conquer back to the, you know, back to the, Mm -hmm. I guess, theme of this podcast is, you know, to conquer the fear and the apprehension of the unknown of like commission sales. Like, hey, you know, car salespeople pump each other up telling each other stories. And it's like, okay, well, I can use this avenue to, you know, make someone's day a little bit lighter, let them have some fun, and then they'll just go crush it that weekend and kind of help them get through that anxiety and have fun with their job. Yeah, not to mention just that's that's another angle, too, is like you to to help the dealership, you know, to maybe – you know, maybe help the young sales guy, give him something, a, a nugget of knowledge as well that maybe exactly. he didn't have or didn't feel confident to to wield, like to say, hey, tell him about this thing. And yes, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it may sound cost prohibitive, but as a salesperson, it's your duty to, to give them all the facts and to let them make the best decision. And, Mm-hmm. You know, instead of, instead of just, you know, and how to confidently give them that information, not just meekly oh you know there's also tax title and license to to comf- comfortably say hey you know this is the sticker price but there are other mm-hmm. few things that we need to this is just for the vehicle itself it's not the work yep. we have to do to get you to take this vehicle off our hands or mm-hmm. with the state to transfer ownership to you mm-hmm. Well, and it's just finding confidence to ask for sale. It's finding confidence to tell someone that, hey, you made a bad decision last time around and now you're 15 grand flipped in your trade in, you know, and it's like, like, that's an awkward conversation to have with people. But I mean, uh, you know, that's something that I'm able to help people kind of fix, not necessarily as a financial advisor, but Mm -hmm. like, hey, this is how we can make the most of the next one. And on the podcast side of it, encouraging salespeople you know, it's really just more of like making their days lighter. So A, they'll be able to do their job and be encouraged and B, that'll translate to the consumer because the consumer will have a better experience when the salesperson's happy. Yeah. Um, And it's not about, you know, profits or whatnot. It's more just about attitude, you know, and, and not being afraid to do something. So, you know, there are those things and I'm actually thinking about starting a 
training site for young salespeople as well as like a mentorship program to teach them how to do things honestly and do things the right way, but also give them a little bit of inspiration to conquer that anxiety of how am I going to make this month and just encourage them, Mm -hmm. you know, because I I do think that that industry needs a little bit of reform. And, And again, from the other concierge side of view, that'll give the customers a much better experience. Yeah. You know, so it's, I guess my goal is to to basically use my previous my my career and my story to just make everything a little bit more fun and a little more transparent for people. Yes. And I would even call it insight is just to say hey. Absolutely. But what I like about it is is the say is the way I like I see it is sales is changing. People are people aren't it's not just product based like you can't just have mm-hmm. people aren't just buying the best product. They're buying from the person. Like there's so sure. much more personal investment in everything, like from makeup to what you know, I had a girl on that does glass custom glassware and and mm-hmm. kind of like th- things like that, like decorative stuff, like that they're not buying the product, they're buying you. Yep. They're getting a car for the Liquid Bond guy. Yeah, and so I'm like curious of how that would translate to say car sales because that's a big purchase, and mm-hmm. it, I feel like so many times I think dealership things are won by personal connection. Like they just feel connected with this deal, this that this guy, whether it's a young guy or an old guy, that this guy, even though he's trying to sell a car, he's he seems like he's he's listening to what I want. He's trying to work with me. And, you know, you just, you just, you develop a, you know, a short lived bond. And for about mm-hmm. two weeks, you guys are yep. constantly talking and, hey, you know, just letting you know, so and so the car is still, you know, still available if you were looking at it, you know, just. Yep. It, absolutely. Yeah. It's all about, in, it's all about that relationship and the, the relationship side of it. You're working with a guy who's, you know, a legally blind guy Mm -hmm. in the industry, which is funny enough. And he's trying, and he's making sure that you're working transparently with a dealership. Like there's, there's kind of a win-win there for a consumer, you know? Yeah. Cause it, it, you know, then they know that I'm really searching for stores and I'm not just, you know, in cahoots with some guy. It's like, okay, working with an honest salesperson and really making sure that that individuals proving themselves, making sure the store has quality business practices and, you know, making sure that, that everybody is able to kind of have that relationship and to, you know, enjoy each other's company through that, the transaction. So, cause that's the thing is like salespeople who are good at what they do will understand that. Mm-hmm. And salespeople who aren't just aren't, you know, um, I mean, I've had to blacklist stores with the concierge thing, like certain dealerships, I'm, I'm not going to work with because of questionable business practices. Yeah. And because the sales guys don't see that relationship, you know, they're just trying to, trying to do what they basically have been told, which is, you know, just get a commitment at all costs, mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. But um, if you can mitigate that and find a store with a quality salesperson, quality business practices, and everybody's able to have a good friendly transaction as a result, then, you know, I, I think the industry's changed for the better in that regard. Yeah, uh, I'm just like, I'm surprised that with social media, that the dealers haven't like the dealers haven't taken the social media to try and basically leverage their position instead of it being a dealership. Mm-hmm. Like to be like to, hey, I'm this guy to make it to where it's almost like dealerships are competing for the car, for the salesperson versus mm-hmm. the customer. Because I feel like if you could get an army of guys like on social media following and stuff that maybe somehow if they can find a way to connect with people and those people come to see them, like mm-hmm. how much money I think could, or, you know, just how much like the, of a game changer for me that that is just to think that, you know, you don't have to, Alan Sam, you know, whatever dealership, mm-hmm. John Wayne dealership, whatever, now has to compete yeah. to get the best salespeople because this salesperson's got 20,000 followers on Instagram. Mm-hmm. It just blows my mind that that could be, that's potentially a future that you could be, 
with your concierge service. It's something like you could maybe, you know, mm -hmm. be your social media experience to say, hey, you know, look at my sales professionals average this and you just have a fo you have a following of customers. I also have a client list of people that are trusting me with their car business and I'm going to teach them so that they can attract customers like mine mm -hmm. wherever they go. So if you don't keep them, if you lose him over after six months and another one of my clients that's recommending that guy, guess what? Mm -hmm. He's going down the street with that dealership where he's working now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they do change quite a bit. There's a lot of trend, a lot of turnover. So, you know, having that following can help a lot of salespeople do. Um, some of them do pretty well on like TikTok and whatnot. The problem is, interestingly enough, is the seediness always kind of comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's an industry that's headed for positive change, but mm -hmm. there's still people stuck in the 1970s, 80s mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, like when social media first came out, we saw a lot of that, a lot of, you know, people that were doing well. And now it's turned into you know, you hop on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist and, you know, 90% of the for sale by owner vehicles are from some OEM dealership that has a questionable reputation, you know? So it's like, there's pros and cons to it. And it's all about understanding the store and their relationship and their willingness to basically like move on with the times, you know, if you're, I mean, the, the dealership, I was at the Chrysler dealership, their slogan in 2015 was selling cars like candy bars. It's like immediately that brings everybody back to a 1980s like hook kind of sketchy transaction. Yeah. And a lot of stores are still stuck in that and will basically die on that hill. Mm -hmm. The Dodge dealership I was at is no longer in business. They were they were bought out. They kind of died on that hill. And so that's the interesting thing is you do have a lot of positive individual salespeople, but you also have a lot of stores that are acting in kind of a peculiar way and mm -hmm. You know, using a using somebody to kind of vet that for you helps you work with a positive store that's going to do the paperwork yeah. correctly, that's going to do you well. Um, you know, the other interesting side of it is you can't say, like, for example, I'm Toyota Ryan, because yeah. Toyota will probably yeah. bring legal action against you. I've seen it happen actually with certain manufacturers. They they do not like you saying like I'm Toyota whatever or it's yeah. like I'm you're affiliated that you're affiliated with them but you're a dealership not Yeah. Like if it's a company, yes, but if it's like an individual saying, you know, in your advertisement I'm Ryan your your social media header is Ryan at Ohio Toyota, they're not going to like that. Yeah. And that's just a manufacturer thing cuz at the end of the day it's a manufacturer is a manufacturer, just like Nike or Sony or Activision. They, you know, they have a professional product to put out. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, I I thank you for doing this, Max. This has been a great conversation. Where can people find you on the internet or social media if they're like interested in either one your program, your training? program they want to keep up to date on that or if they want to just connect with you and just follow your on instagram so my business has an instagram and a facebook page the car buyers concierge buyers plural mm -hmm. uh same with the website as well i don't know if you're going to be dropping a link to that but um uh you can also find me the legally blind guy or the legally blind photographer okay um i Post some pretty interesting pictures on Instagram. I don't use it a whole lot, but it's, excuse me, on a personal level, but it's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, my goal with those sites is to basically, like I said, tell people, hey, there's this legally blind guy doing weird stuff, you know, like taking pictures. And uh, and my goal is to just inspire people to kind of conquer their fear and just go, you yeah. know, and just work hard. And uh if anybody's up and coming in the sales industry, I'm going to have that training up. I don't have everything dialed in just yet. It's something I've been working on for the last week or two. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, just go to the Car Buyers Concierge website and let me know that in, in the little lead generator on the bottom, the comment section. Um, and that way I can give you updates when that is there to motivate you and to basically help you be you know, the best you can in, in that world. Absolutely. We'll have all the links in the, my show notes. I usually put all your whatever links you 
you want there and I'll have them. Awesome. I really do appreciate that. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. I do hope people have been kind of inspired through my unusual story and uh, kind of have some fun with it. And hopefully I get to, you know, potentially work with some of y'all. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again for taking on that fear and, you know, actually trying to use it not only in a productive way, but a beneficial way for all people, not just yourself, not just your, it's not just you overcoming fear. You're helping other people overcome fear of making a huge purchase like an automobile and things like, and helping dealerships, you know, conquer the fear of work and everything else. So thanks yep. again. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. So that was Max. What a great story. I really was inspired by his uh, by his whole story and how he's basically overcome the physical challenges to to carve a niche out in the automotive industry and to and to do so many different things that are so helpful in the car buying process. Check him out at the Legally Blind Photographer as well as the Car Buyers Concierge, where you can look at carbuyersconcierge.com or his Instagram or Facebook. He's also starting a podcast called The Dealership Experience, and he's going to be doing that here shortly. He's going to start a podcast. I was actually the first person he ever agreed to be interviewed by, so he was that was his first foray into actually being a guest or doing anything in the podcasting realm. So that was quite an honor. I was very I was very flattered with that. And we had some really good discussions. I hope nothing but the best for him success wise with his uh podcast, the dealership experience. Check that out when it does come out. We'll have links to that as well. So I'm very excited for him and it's very it was very inspiring to hear that you know, that even have being legally blind doesn't stop him from owning the car of his dreams. Maybe he can't drive it, but he still has it. Sometimes it's just a it's just a, a, a vision or something that you can go you physically look at and say, I achieved that. Some people it's trophies and and wards and everything else. Others it's basically, you know, just having, you know, physical physical trophies like, you know, and uh, have being able to afford a Porsche that if even though he can't drive it, he can get someone that he has a friend or a loved one that can. So yeah, check him out. I, I'm super pumped this weekend. I I got a surprise uh, work gig with Hyenas in Dallas. I work with Rick Gutierrez this week. It was a fantastic show. I am hoping to have some Instagram reels started here this week. So we will see how that goes. I'm very excited to do that. I've got another interview later tonight with a comedian. I did one yesterday. And we'll try to get some more as the months go on. Uh, it's been a fantastic spring so far. Next week, I'll actually be in Jefferson, Texas with uh, Daryl Felsberg. Uh, we'll be doing a show at a bar there. So come out if you're in the Jefferson, Texas area. I don't know how much my listenership is there, but who knows. Thanks again for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. And now some thank yous for the folks that make this show possible. Thanks to Barry Whitewater for my art and graphics. You can follow him on Instagram at bwhiteh2o. Get it? H2O, like water. You can also follow him on Facebook. Music. A huge thank you to Gunnar Olson for the wonderful music provided for this podcast. You can follow him on Instagram at gunbuns, that's G-U-N-B-U-N-S, as well as his website, gunnarolson.net. Check out some of the samples that he has recorded. They're amazing. He's an amazing percussionist. If you want to follow the show, we've got a Facebook group, Some of All Fears. Instagram, Twitter, you can find us at Some Fear Fans. If you have some feedback for the show, email me at Some Fear Fans, S O M E F E A R F A N S, at gmail.com. I'll be happy to, to take those into consideration. Also, if you'd like to be a guest, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com. We can try to iron out some details and get that settled in. You know, give us some feedback if on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a review. It makes the show bigger, and it's not going anywhere. I'm going to record as many shows as I possibly can. 
If you want to follow me on social media, I am at Ryan Perio. It's R-Y-A-N-P-E-R-R-I-O on all social media platforms. You can follow me there. And you can check me out at ryanperio.com, my website. I'll try to list upcoming shows there as well. It's been kind of spotty because as soon as I set it up, that's when the pandemic happened. And everything's kind of just in a in a holding pattern. Thanks again for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast. Next week, we'll have another guest with another fear. Thanks for listening. <laughs>